Long-form investigative journalism into religion and communities keeps me rethinking and assessing what I know about power dynamics within communities. How do those with power use it? It's often impossible to know what the internal dynamics are like in communities for years, and I am delighted to discuss the life of Yogi Bhajan, the spiritual director of the Healthy Happy Holy Organization, also known as 3HO, and who also introduced a version of Kundalini Yoga to the USA. My guests on the episode to discuss Bhajan's life are Stacy Stukin and Philip D. Slip, and we discuss their article, How Siri Singh Saab Yogi Bhajan Created an Empire, which features the findings of months of reporting, dozens of interviews, and thousands of document pages reviewed. Stukin and De Slip's article exposes how Yogi Bhajan's claim title of Siri Singh Saab enabled the yogi to abuse generations of his followers. Links to the article and other relevant readings are included in the notes of this episode. You can follow Stukin on Twitter at Stacy Stukin, and you can follow De Slip on Twitter at Philip De Slip. You can find me on Twitter as well at Classical underscore Ideas. Thank you so much for listening. Stacy Stukin and Philip De Slip, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Stacy, you've never been here before. Philip's been on the show before, but I'm wondering if we can start with having you as our as my first time, as your first time on the show, introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners out there, however you see fit, so they know who you are and what you do. Well, my name is Stacey Stukin. I am a Los Angeles-based journalist and essayist. Um, I write mostly about arts and culture, and I'm also very interested in Los Angeles history. Um, I was a contributing editor at Yoga Journal for many years. So I did write and have continued to cover the health and wellness space. And I actually met Philip. He was a source of mine when I did a piece that came out now in July of 2020, almost two years ago. But we probably met in the spring of that year. And he was um, a very generous source. And we continued to have a dialogue, which turned into um, a working relationship. Philip, you have been here before, as I mentioned. And I'm wondering if you can just kind of Remind the listeners who you are and what you do, and maybe a little bit of what you've been up to since the last time you were here. Um, yeah, my name is Philip Deeslip. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Religious Studies at UC Santa Barbara. Most of my research focuses on uh, Asian and metaphysical religions in modern America. So I've written about the early history of yoga, um, early Buddhist converts uh, in the U.S., and also uh, done a lot of research and some writing on new religious movements uh, and religious cults. And so uh, in many ways, um, 3HO is kind of the, uh, the combination of a lot of those things. Wonderful. Can you just maybe like elaborate on that term really quick, 3HO, for those listening out there who don't really know what that means? So 3HO is short for the Healthy, Happy, Holy Organization. So this is the entity that is incorporated after the man we'll be talking about for a lot of this episode, Yogi Bhajan, comes to the United States. Um, and as we're going to get into, he creates a bewildering, complex jumble of different nonprofit entities, for-profit businesses, with an array of titles and uh, in various names. So 3HO is a specific entity, but it also works both for members of the group and those outside of the group as an effective shorthand to describe this whole um, mini universe of entities that were created in after Yogi Bhajan's arrival. Very cool. Well, I was delighted to receive an article from the both of you that you recently co-authored called How Siri Singh Saab Yogi Bhajan Created an Empire. And I'm I'm curious about the story of how 
you each came to know about this person and why you came to care about reporting on his life. So Stacy, I'm wondering if you can give me a little background of your interest in this particular person and what he has done in the world. Well, as a longtime yoga practitioner and yoga journalist, um, 3HO and Kundalini Yoga was on my radar for a long time. In fact, I had done the yoga at his um, flagship yoga studio, which is in my neighborhood here in Los Angeles. Um, And I had been interested in the organization for many years because being the nosy reporter I am, (laughs) I had done a lot of research and I knew about the businesses that they owned, I knew about, I had heard the rumors of the misconduct. Um, And they also had this very uh, notable presence in Los Angeles because you would see them walking around with their white turbans, wearing white. Many of them drove fancy cars of a certain ilk because it, it, there really is a caste system within the organization. And then, you know, of course, there was the celebrity factor, the yoga factor. So for many years, I had wanted to write about 3HO, and then I got an, um, an opportunity. And this particular story um, was something that Philip and I had batted around um, because for many years, years people always said the title is fake the title of Siri Sings Out is fake he made it up so Philip and with his historian's kind of point of view said let's figure out if it's really fake and it kind of it took us on this journey um, that culminated in the piece that you're referring to for Boz News. I love it. Philip, what about you? You've been here to talk about the history of early American yoga on the podcast before. And I'm wondering about your origin of interest in, in the uh, Siri Singh Saab as well. So um, my very first week as an undergraduate at the University of Connecticut, I saw a flyer and uh, I took a free yoga class. In nice. Kundalini yoga as taught by Yogi Bhajan. And I practiced the yoga. I even taught it. Um, and lived in proximity um, on and off uh, to various 3HO communities for about a decade. And when I stopped practicing the yoga and I left, I started um, a master's program at the University of Iowa. And I initially started researching the early history of yoga. And a light bulb went off when I realized that a lot of these figures in the 1920s and 30s there was no there there they just made up titles they made up credentials and since i had started to develop chops as a researcher um, i thought i wonder if i wonder if i turned the lens on to this type of yoga that i did for about a decade i wonder what i'd find and so i obsessively dug into it and in 2012 an article about that research was published in the journal Sick Formations. And that very effectively, and with a lot of receipts, uh, dispelled the claims that Yogi Bhajan made about his yoga, that it was ancient, that it was secret, um, that it was all these things. And I kind of thought that that was, um, that was it. That was kind of my, what I did on the way out. I, I did this research, I had it published, I uh, kind of set the record straight on where the yoga came from. And then about eight years later, there was um, you know, a whole sequence of events that we can talk about that really brought Yogi Bhajan's claims and his history of abuse to the forefront. And while Stacy was doing uh, background research for her feature for Los Angeles Magazine, she got in touch with me and we kept talking. And one of the things that was clear to both of us is that 3HO is, for a small organization, it's incredibly complex. It has this really involved and intricate history. Um, And as we're going to get into, I mean, even the organizational structure of it is complex. And so after her article came out, we, we talked and we kind of realized that you really do need two brains and two sets of eyes to look at it, to really deal with it effectively. And so, Mm. um, we have different, uh, and I would add, we have, 
we have different skill sets in many ways and um, and we have different sources and we have different perspectives. So I think that, you know, our collaboration has been very fruitful because we each bring different things to the table. Wonderful. Well, you know, Stacey, I'm, I'm curious about uh, Yogi Bhajan and his, and his life because for me, this is a brand new topic. Whenever I got this article from the two of you, I was learning about something brand new for the first time. I had heard the term Kundalini Yoga before, but the life story of the central character in this piece was brand new. And for the benefit of the listeners out there, I'm wondering if you can sort of give me an overview of the trajectory of Yogi Bhajan's life story. Well, he was born um, in what is now Pakistan. Um, He was a customs official at Delhi airport. Um, He came to the United States in 1968 via Canada. Um, And he ends up in Los Angeles and he um, got a job teaching yoga at a place called the East West Center that was run by a woman named Judith Tyberg. And that was kind of a serious place actually, um, where people who were interested in Eastern thought would go and it had a library and such. But he um, started teaching yoga there and promptly got kicked out. And Heiberg never really revealed um, why she, she asked him to leave. But it was also, you know, it was, you know, It was 1969, he starts the Happy Healthy Holy Organization. It is hippie haven here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Everybody's doing LSD, smoking pot. And being the astute customs official, if you can imagine that kind of brain, you know, he said, oh, I'm going to teach you how to get high on your breath. You don't have to do drugs. And so he started teaching what he called Kundalini Yoga. Um, and, you know, Philip's piece, if, if anybody's interested, he kind of breaks down, you know, the origins of that and how it's really kind of a bricolage of all these different forms of yoga. Um, but, and actually the first yoga classes were like, I could walk there. It's right up the street from here. Mm-hmm. Um, it was in an old antique store. And, you know, there was a, stream of people coming in and out and then he starts creating um ashrams and it quickly grows and the whole point is to create yoga teachers and he's sending that them out all over the country and later all over the world really um he claims he's celibate but married um and they begin to have a real presence in los angeles they consider themselves householder yogis so they start businesses um and from there, it's been going on 50 years and they build businesses. Um, so I am a little bit curious about, Philip, if you can give just sort of a really brief, as brief as you can, explanation of Kundalini and kind of how that is uh, distinct within yoga practice. Do you have any thoughts on that? So that's one of the kind of shrewd and clever things that Yogi Bhajan does is by, by naming his form of yoga, Kundalini yoga, um, he really kind of um, ties himself to uh, one of the most kind of exotic and powerful ideas within yoga. So um, for millennia, yogis have talked about uh, the kind of primal energy within human beings that's depicted as being coiled at the base of the spine like a serpent. And there are texts and there are practices that are dedicated to awakening this serpent energy. And it's mysterious. And people who have written about the experience of Kundalini awakening uh, say that it's it's unpredictable, um, it's massive, it's chaotic, it's life transforming. And what Yogi Bhajan does, which is kind of brilliant, is he says, I can teach the yoga that is the most effective way to raising your kundalini, awakening mm-hmm. kundalini within you, but he shifts the goalpost. So this kind of like 
radical, dramatic, terrifying experience, he says, well, that's not how I raise it. Um, he gives these very kind of mundane um, results from what happens to raising your Kundalini with his yogic practice. You're, you feel better, you have more energy, you're more creative. So he's able to kind of lay claim to this mystic, powerful energy without really having to produce any of the typical results that other people who have had Kundalini awakening experiences describe. Interesting. Okay. Well, so let's get into this article here a little bit. Now that we kind of have a little bit of a framing here under our belts, you open the article um, with an anecdote from the 1970 election season when Bajan took 84 Americans on a yoga pilgrimage in India, leading to a trip to the Golden Temple of Amritsar. And I'm wondering, Phil, if you can kind of take me to the beginning of your piece and kind of lay this out for me, like what was going on with this trip with uh, Yogi Bhajan and his uh, and his pilgrimage attendees from the States? Tell me a little bit about what was going on with this. Okay. So when Stacy mentioned Yogi Bhajan arriving in Los Angeles at the right place at the right time, it's, it's absolutely accurate. There's an ocean of young people who want a guru, they want a spiritual teacher, they want to do yoga. So Yogi Bhajan very quickly finds himself um, with a lot of students. And I personally think that one of the reasons he sent so many people across the country and had them become teachers was to just kind of disperse all these people who were coming to him. So after a few years, he plans a trip to India and he gets 84 students to go. When you look at 3HO's own description, descriptions of this trip, they describe it as sightseeing, seeing mystical India. Uh, he tells a reporter for the Washington Post, we're researching how to get young people off of drugs. Um, inside 3HO to his students, uh, the big draw is that they are gonna be spending time uh, with Yogi Bhajan's teacher, uh, Baba Virsa Singh. Um, you can kind of see this tension as Yogi Bhajan spends more time in Los Angeles. He's more and more reticent to give credit to the teachers that he originally does when he first arrives. His Hatha Yoga teacher, Swami Durendra Brahmachari and Baba Virsa Singh, who he kind of credits as his spiritual teacher. He kind of wants it for himself. He and his students arrive in New Delhi and after paying their respects to Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, they go to Baba Virsa Singh's uh, center, Gobind Sadhan, and very quickly things go south. Um, Baba Virsa Singh, like all other Sikhs, uh, looks puzzled and he wonders, why the heck are you people doing yoga? Yeah. And Yogi Bhajan is clearly uncomfortable with his students kind of showing deference to him. And they have a face-to-face -face, uh, confrontation, um, just them and three other observers. And Yogi Bhajan uh, basically tries to broker a deal and says, hey, why don't I just keep my students? I do my thing, you do your thing. And he's essentially laughed out of the room. So in a huff, Yogi Bhajan takes his students away from Baba Virsa Singh and always the shrewd customs agent, he thinks on his feet. And suddenly he tells his students, stop talking about the yoga so much. And he starts telling people, he is not a yoga teacher, he's a Sikh missionary. He's mm. converting American hippies to the Sikh tradition. And there's an election season. And so he does really well carting these students from village to village uh, on buses and having them perform rudimentary care. And they are like a sideshow. People in villages and cities will come out to see um, these American hippies um, acting like Sikhs. Mm. And eventually this gains enough steam that he takes them to Amritsar, to the uh, central seats of Sikh authority. Um, so he takes them to the Hari Mandir Sahib or the Golden Temple. And while saying that he is this great missionary for Sikhi, um, he has several of his students undergo uh, the initiatory rite of Amrit, which is in the Sikh tradition, it's a very big deal. It's a very deep commitment. Um, I know several Sikhs who are lifelong observant practitioners 
who even for them taking Amrit is a very serious step. It's a very big deal. And he has these students who have no idea what they're doing take Amrit. And he even uh, marries many of them off to Punjabi men. Um, and he's given a very kind of perfunctory title. He's essentially given a letter saying, hey, you're kind of like a minister, people in America ask, because no one really knows what to do. This is such an oddity of this guy just showing up and he calls himself a yogi, but he's a Sikh. And you have these American hippies who are dressed like Punjabis and they're, they're undergoing all these things. And a few weeks after uh, their arrival in the Golden Temple, Yogi Bhajan is arrested in New Delhi on uh, charges of fraud. Oh my gosh. One of the people who gets married to one of his students uh, says, I paid this guy all this money for a green card at a wife <laughs> and it didn't really happen. And so he's arrested, he gets out on bail, he skips bail, and then he leaves the country. And he also loses students along the way too, because I think he starts out with 84 and some of them see that there's like marijuana growing like on the side of the road. So they just kind of go off, oh, we're just going to and go to Goa. You know, so it just becomes this, you know, kind of free for all that he's trying to keep, keep it, keep it together. And he, and he, in many ways, shrewdly does. Yeah. Amazing. He, he, yes. Uh, well, there's, there's, there's this interesting dynamic too, that it's kind of obvious, but the people who leave, they leave. They're not around to tell stories to the people who stay. Mm -hmm. So that turnover suits him very well. Yeah. Um, because no lot. one's kind of calling him out or fact checking him in real time. Yeah. Exactly. And there's no and there's no Twitter. So you can't call each other out publicly and retweet, be like, hey, this person's like a fake because it's all pre-internet. So it's really there's no there's no checking of him in real time, you know? Yeah. So um Stacy, like I, I love the journalistic aspect that that is in this because there are interviews of tracking down people who went on some of these pilgrimages. And I would love to know about the research process that went into documenting these early days, because uh, the, the amount of work that went into this piece is, is truly, truly rich. And I want to hear all about it. Well, thank you for acknowledging that, all the work, um, because it, it really was quite an undertaking. undertaking. Um, so, I mean, you, you're really talking about kind of the reporting process. Um, and when you're doing a big investigative piece like this, you're relying on um, public records so you can track people down that way sometimes. Um, relationships, I think, are very crucial to this kind of reporting. Um, and since both Philip and I have been looking into 3HO for him much longer than me, but I had always been kind of tracking it, you know, in my own way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had relationships in the community as well. And then through my reporting, develop others. So you give people a call, say, hey, I'm trying to reach this person. Sometimes it's it's literally finding the phone number and making a phone, a cold call. Um, you know, I've been hung up on. Sometimes I get a little something, sometimes I don't, but I, you know, maybe next time they'll talk to me. So there's newspaper archives. This particular organization um, has a lot of periodicals. And so it's kind of pouring through those, looking for names, where are these people? Um, you know, social media has really changed reporting in so many ways because you can go down, you know, social media rabbit holes, you know, trying to see who's friends with who and find who and who. Um, but I think that the most crucial thing for something, a piece like this that's difficult, where you're getting people to talk for the very first time, which we did, it's really relationships and gaining trust and assuring your source that you are, one, not gonna make them look dumb, two, that they can trust you to portray what they say to you accurately, and three, to take pride in the fact-checking process and really go back meticulously and, you know, make sure because, you know, people get stuff wrong. And because there's two of us, we, you know, we would, we could go uh, make sure everything was 
you know, airtight with receipts. Mm -hmm. Well, and there are plenty of receipts. We'll get into the documentation later on that you two include in the article, which was very compelling. But, you know, there's a there's an interview that's included in there where one of the interview participants calls what Yogi Bhajan was doing a desecration of sacred ceremonies. Um, and Philip, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on that for me. What was the what was like he doing with these pilgrimage folks that was considered a desecration like by today's standards? Um. I think in the most basic sense, it was convincing naive American hippies to take Amrit uh, at the Hari Mandir Sahib in Amritsar. I mean, it really would be the equivalent of, you know, converting to, Catholic, converting to Catholicism uh, at St. Peter's Cathedral. Mm. Um, and it kind of connects to what Stacy was talking about about the reporting process. One of the things that we that we say to each other often is it's it's often not the first conversation you have with someone. It's the third or the fourth or the fifth. Um, it's all of the the knowledge and the facts and the awareness that you bring to those conversations. And it's also appreciating that it's a very sensitive subject that the people that you're talking to, in some cases in real time as you're talking to them, they're putting pieces together and they're kind of understanding the magnitude and severity of everything that happened. And so in that quote that you mentioned, uh, when this woman apologizes for taking Amrit at the Golden Temple, I think it's, it's part of that. It's part of this, um, slowly building awareness of what happened and this reckoning, realizing mm. um, the consequences of what happened and how kind of deliberate and destructive Yogi Bhajan's quest for power and control ended up being over the course of decades. Mm. Well, that, uh, that, that quest for power kind of comes in really nicely here with a crucial turning point where he suddenly sort of allegedly gets some kind of authorization where he changes his name from Yogi Bhajan to Siri Singh Saab. And he gets this new title of chief religious and administrative authority for the Western hemisphere, which is quite a title. And he comes to almost be seen in that you write in the article as like a Pope of six. And then he goes on and to start an empire of tea companies and security companies that secured billions of dollars in contracts from the U S government and this is like the, a massive leap for me where he goes from like taking Americans on a pilgrimage, on a yoga pilgrimage to being some kind of like security contractor. And like, Stacy, I'm wondering if you can walk me through this a little bit. What in the world happens and how does he make this work upon his return to the United States where he has this new title and suddenly has all of this additional power and influence? Like, tell walk me through this. Well, it's... It's in some ways it happens in immediately and other ways it's kind of a slow creep. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it it's um so what what the establishment of the religion and the title does, it gives him both temporal and spiritual power over his followers. And simultaneously their lifestyle becomes much more prescriptive where he, you know designates how they should be living, what they should be eating, when they should be intimate with their spouses. And you also have a very entrepreneurial group of people. It's an, it, it's an interesting phenomenon that they all come together. They're all hippies, they're wearing turbans. So in some ways they can't go out and get conventional jobs because they look different. Mm -hmm. So they start building their own businesses. And Yogi Bhajan also has a phrase um, that he used to call OPI and OPM, which meant other people's intelligence and other people's money. 
So he was which cool. which he steals from a late night infomercial, by the way. <laughs> it was like a get rich quick real estate seminar that just comes into like spiritual wisdom. I mean, I like to say he's like the Ron Popeil of yoga. I like, you know, dice yeah. it, dice it. You know, it's just if you look at some of his lectures, some of the things he says, and I think we have some of those quotes in the piece, it's like give the money to the serious things of the serious things of will will take care of you. And you know, honestly those first generation members were joining something communal. They did want to create like a socialistic entrepreneurial model that could help better people. So this is kind of happening simultaneously as, you know, boomer culture is kind of colliding with wellness culture Mm -hmm. and the rise of um, all these hippies becoming business people. And it's a time in our society, both economic and social and culturally, where these businesses are being more accepted. We all remember Carib, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're they're starting to buy bakeries. Um, The kind of tea that they're drinking is the chai tea, you know, from, from, you know, the Indian style tea with cardamom, clove, pepper, black pepper ginger, et cetera. Um, And, you know, I I could point out other companies that were on similar trajectories as Yogi Tea. There's, you know, Organic Valley, Stonyfield Yogurt, John Mackey with Whole Foods. So, you know, all these things are happening at the same time. Mm. Um, And then you add to it that these people are not being paid well because they are part of an organization that promotes this idea of seva, which is a Sikh um, concept, but this is taken to a very almost abusive level. People are working way below standard wages. So subsequently the businesses can grow even more. And then the, the um, you also have the rise of the yoga industry. So it's just kind of a timing and situational and organizational. All these things start to just, you know, come together at, at the perfect time. In terms of the security company, um, this goes along with Yogi Bhajan starting to build political capital. You know, when he's here in Los Angeles, there's a piece in it, there's a picture in our story, like he's meeting with the mayor. Mm-hmm. He moves to New Mexico. One of his lieutenants at one point is the deputy attorney general of the state. He builds alliances with Bill Richardson, with congressmen, representatives. And all the while, there's a security company that started in New Mexico. And they're basically doing concert security. And they start to get bigger and bigger jobs. And then somehow, in 1986, their first government contract is the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. And, you know, that's literally a place where they're testing weapons. Um, And it's also at a time where government contracts are trying to be more inclusive and include small businesses. So they're able to take advantage of that as well. And they can also like underbid everybody Mm. because they're not paying people properly. Right. Um, So subsequently the contracts keep um, they start um, earning more contracts in places like federal courthouses, embassies, ICE detention centers, um, and they become the oh, the, the New York Times. There's a piece in the Times in the early 2000s that that stated that they were the only security company owned by a nonprofit religious organization. Hmm. So figure, um, and. The actual company, A Call, mysteriously closed last year, um, but stay tuned. We may have more on that soon. Wonderful. Well, you know, I want to hear a little bit more about this incorporation of what is called in the article the Sikh Dharma Brotherhood as Yogi Bhajan as the corporation soul. And, you know, I'm I'm not a super business savvy person myself. So, Philip, I'm wondering if you can walk me through why incorporation was so important and why it was so important that Yogi Bhajan be labeled as corporation soul. Walk me through this. Um, so this might be the 
the greatest example of Yogi Bhajan's uh, adopted motto of OPI, OPM. Mm -hmm. So in the early 70s, one of Yogi Bhajan's students is a lawyer named Philip Hoskins. And Hoskins was kind of the, the go-to lawyer in early 3HO. He wanted to close on a house, he wanted to start a business, go to Philip Hoskins. And so he tells Yogi Bhajan that, you know, what you should really do is you should uh, incorporate the religion and you should create this particular kind of corporation known as a corporation soul. And so he says, you know, to Yogi Bhajan, you can have control over everything. You can accept donations. You don't have to have an accounting for the money that comes in. You avoid scrutiny. Uh, it's a dream for Yogi Bhajan. So what a corporation soul is, kind of the name has it, it's a corporation that is run by a single person. Not exactly a person, but a title holder. Mm -hmm. So probably the easiest comparison is the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, a bishop has complete control over all of the assets within a diocese. And it's not so much the bishop as a person, but it's the title that the bishop holds. So what a corporation soul allows is for a title holder to run the affairs of a religion without a conflict of interest, without a board of directors, without shareholders, all of the things that would keep a regular corporation in check are gone with a corporate mm. soul. So what Yogi Bhajan needs to have this level of power is he needs a title and he needs a religion. So what they do in 1973, uh, Yogi Bhajan, Philip Hoskins and Pamela Dyson, also known as Premka, they all sign the incorporation papers for the Sikh Dharma Brotherhood. So they have a legally incorporated religious entity. That is the first time that the phrase Siri Singsab ever appears in print. Afterwards, Yogi Bhajan will say, yeah, remember when I was at the Golden Temple in 71? They made me Siri Singsab. Conveniently, the two people that he points to as calling him the Siri Singsab, they die in late 1972. Yeah. So four months after any living witness to this exchange would have been gone, he makes this claim. But the important thing is they incorporate the religion. Um, and then in 1974, he does a lot of housekeeping. He starts creating this structure of junior and senior ministers. He creates this representative body within 3HO comprised of his ministers called the Khalsa Council. He goes back and forth to India a few times um, and he seems to shore up support. Uh, he hosts uh, Sikh officials in the U.S. And even in 3HO magazines, his students are told, start calling him the Siri Singsop. This is his title. And then at the very end of 1974, they file the papers that are approved in 1975. And Yogi Bhajan as the Siri Singsop is the corporation soul that manages the affairs of Sikh Dharma, the religion. Mm. And a corporation soul can do everything with the assets of a religion. It can buy property, sell property, lend money, accept money, create businesses, create jobs, dissolve organizations. Um, it can do everything. And that is the critical thing about this title. When Stacey yeah. and I started researching it over a year ago, we thought it was simply a fake title. We thought it was simply a uh, a false claim to seek religious authority. But the reality is um, the power of the title was really in its actual power, the stuff yeah. that it could do. So what happens, just to use the example of property, once the corporation soul is formed, um, all of the residential ashrams around the country start getting restructured. And it seems like a very kind of simple thing they are designated to be to serve the purposes of the religion of sikh dharma if anything should happen the property goes to sikh dharma what no one really appreciates except for a few people at the very top is as the siri singsab yogi bhajan has singular control over all of those assets 
So as one person told us in the story, by signing over those ashrams to the religion, um, Yogi Bhajan got people to pay the mortgages on homes they no longer owned. And in several cases, when he wanted money, he could have those properties be liquidated, mm. signed over to him. Wow. Um, you know, and th- there's a lot of effects that trickle down to families as well. And Stacy, like the, some of the stories about the kids, the lives of kids of followers in your piece were very gripping. And can you tell me a little bit about what was going on with the the lives of the followers' children uh, during this time as well? Because those are some vivid stories and details too that I think everybody should know. I think that the story of the second generation of 3HO is where the temporal and spiritual control converge in perhaps the worst way. Because what happens is that these children's parents are listening to Yogi Bhajan for every aspect of their life. Mm -hmm. So their business, their family, their spiritual. And so what starts happening is he starts um, promoting what he's calling kind of detachment parenting. And kids are getting moved around. They're getting swapped into other families. They're getting sent to camps without their parents. Um, Boarding schools get developed in uh, India. They get sent away there. Some as young as five years old. The conditions are horrendous. They, you know, they're getting hepatitis. They're malnourished. They're dirty. Um, They're neglected. it's been described as kind of a Lord of the Flies uh, scenario. You know, they're bullied by each other. They're abused by the people in charge of them, sexually, physically. Um, and even for the kids who don't end up in India, um, some of them end up in arranged marriages. They don't get good edu- educations. There's grooming of young women. Um, it's a very patriarchal view of, you know, the relationship between men and women. And so if you, especially women, single women who come in with a child and let's say they want to leave, if they leave, they're shunned, they're, they're prostitutes on the street. I mean, that's kind of a, a term that we've heard over and over. You're, you're going to do drugs. You're going to become a prostitute on the street. Um, that's not to say young men were not um, physically abused or sexually abused as well. Um, and then they're also forced to do yoga in this prescriptive lifestyle. That means not much to them um, because they didn't choose it. Mm-hmm. And subsequently, in the current state of what's going on with the second generation, you know, there's very complicated relationships because you know some are completely out and they're navigating family members who are still part of the community. So that creates a lot of um, tension and, um, and uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. Um, and, but there is now a reparations program. Oh, interesting. Um, that is, was, driven really by the second generation getting together. A group of them hired a lawyer. There are at least one lawsuit that is still outstanding, still going forward that we know of, Um, but the reparations program was the result of a group of second generation, both male and female, getting together, hiring a lawyer who who has done work on behalf of survivors of USA Gymnastics and Boy Scouts of America, and basically went to the organization and said, um, let's figure out a way to, to make this work. So it's, it's part of an independent reparations program, which means they bring in a third party and people can file their claim. And if they do not like the claim, uh, the, the reparation that they receive, they can take further, you know, civil or legal actions should they choose to. Um, this is all new territory in both how reparations are de- dealt with and new territory within 3HO. 
In fact, there are members of the second generation who are sit on the Siri Singh Saab board, um, who are advocating for their peers. Um, and then there is a whole group, a whole other group of what um, we call double downers who just will not see or acknowledge the abuse. So it's a very, a very complicated web of, you know, kind of, you know, both trauma and resilience because some of these, these, they're adults now. I mean, you know, they, you know, some of them have really made, you know, strides and they're really cool people. And, you know, I'd like to hang out with some of them. You yeah. Know? Um, there was also a lot of, you know, suicides, drug addiction. Um, a lot of them, they're, they're their own diaspora. And part of this reparations program also is trying to track some of them down. Mm. Uh, so I think in all of this, the second generation is, um, you know, it's the most when people read the stories, they often really respond to that as kind of the most heart-wrenching, you know, part of this reckoning because these, you know, they were born into it. They had no choice. So while some are still in though, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a push and pull. Yeah. Um, you know, Stacey, I'm curious about the, the timeline of this reparations program, like in response to all the, the allegations and things like that, what's been the, like the, the timeline sort of, of, um, of these programs that are, that are happening right now. Kind of tell me about like, when did this start? And, you know, I'm just wondering about when this is all happening in the grand scheme of the story. Um, well, they just announced the reparations program in June, but prior to that, they were trying to do this kind of truth and reconciliation program, and they hired another uh, consultancy, a firm called Just Outcomes. So there was a lot of meetings. They were given money uh, for therapy, um, but it became clear that that wasn't enough, that the that that the harm done needed more acknowledgement and quite frankly, compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, a lot of these, um, they didn't get good education. Some of them were told not to go to college and to go work at substandard rate wages in the 3HO businesses. Um, so the program was released, announced in June, but this has been a process that, um, began, you know, probably with the with the publication of the Premka memoir, which kind of created, and should I explain what that is now? Here? Sure, that's fine, yeah. Um, so in January of 2020, uh, um, Pamela Sahara Dyson, otherwise known as Premka Carr, was... Um, the secretary general of the organization, and she was also Yogi Bhajan's mother for that. Um, but it was a clandestine affair because he claimed he was celibate. Um, it turns out he was also having relations with many of his other secretaries. Um, so she publishes this memoir and it's kind of, again, a convergence of time and place and circumstance that creates the perfect storm because we're get, you know, just hunkering down into a pandemic. And um, I get a call from a colleague about this memoir. And so I start my reporting. And then around the same time, there's, we're all on Zoom. We're just like freaking out on Zoom because we're trying <laughs> to do that. And so the second generation organizes this big Zoom call and they just, tell their stories, even though these stories have been known and I will, it has been documented and known since the nineties, but it became this thing like, finally people were, would recognize it. And what, so, so then a, a prominent second gen who was in the inner circle, who is, um, also a pretty popular yoga teacher. She goes to one of the other senior women in the organization 
tells her story of abuse. Um, and they hire another consultancy called an, an Olive Branch to look into the sexual misconduct. And in fact, Philip and I, that was the first piece that we wrote together. I think that was in August of 2020, is that correct? Yep. So the Olive Branch report is released and you know, it is really kind of an astounding document. I mean, they spoke to over 200 people. They concluded more likely than not, you know, raped, battered, abused, sexual misconduct, being young women. But what they also did, which was an interesting choice, is they spoke to people, supporters of Yogi Bhajan too. And in fact, Philip and I were at a, um, a conference this past spring, it was called um, um, it was a sexual abuse and religious religion conference and we, I was speaking to a lawyer there and we were talking about the Olive Branch report and she said you know the thing that was so odd was why did they speak to the supporters too so you know the, because the supporters said things like he's like Buddha or the Christ he could not do this he's our spiritual leader he doesn't have time for these you know, earthly kind of debauchery. You know? <laughs> um, you know, he could read my aura. These women are lying. They have epigenetic trauma, you know. So it was, it, so it's, but in the end, they did conclude that he more likely than not. So it was just kind of this snowball that kept going. So between the olive branch, the Zoom calls, the memoir, you know, my piece in Los Angeles Magazine um, and just people starting to talk to each other who hadn't spoken to each other on social media for many years and the stories just came flooding out and that's how we got to where we are today. Well, Philip, I'm wondering if uh, you can sort of bring us in for a landing here. I'm curious about denunciation against Yogi Bhajan and kind of what happened to his empire after he died. I'm curious about kind of how this, this story sort of concludes with his time as a person on earth. Yeah, so if 2020 is the crescendo of allegations and revelations against Yogi Bhajan, there's a buildup to it almost from the very beginning. So um yogi bhajan is abusing people bef he's abusing people as soon as he lands in los angeles in fact mm -hmm. there's good evidence that he comes to los angeles from canada because he got a student of his pregnant in toronto and was mm -hmm. that so there were always people trying to blow the whistle on yogi bhajan it's you know it's word of mouth there are some pieces in magazines and newspapers throughout the 70s and 80s uh in the late 90s uh, as the internet starts to take off there are early message boards and forums that start talking about these things um on the religious side of things um there's this unusual there's several unusual relationships that are going on between Sikh religious authorities in India and Yogi Bhajan and his organization primarily in the United States. So one of the confusing aspects is Yogi Bhajan incorporates a religion that has a very similar name to the religion itself. He calls his incorporated religion Sikh Dharma, the Sikh way of life, um, which is very easily confused for Sikhi itself. And so there's this intentional and mistaken confusion that goes on where um, he lets so many people assume that he is the general Sikh authority. And that's how he's represented in American newspapers. That's how he gets audiences with two popes and the Dalai Lama and American politicians. Um, but there's a funny thing that happens in India when pressed for an answer uh, Sikh authorities in India will say, well, we respect his missionary efforts, but we didn't give him this title. Um, that's his own thing. Um, but that doesn't really stick, despite the strong statements from 
heads of the SGPC, the administrative body that looks over uh, Sikh Gurdwaras in Northern India. Um, perhaps the strongest denunciation is in the late 70s with the Jatadar or head of the Akal Tukit, the kind of highest seat of temporal authority in the Sikh tradition. Um, Jatadar Sadhu Singh Bahadur issues a, a formal statement, a hukam nama, where he says this title doesn't exist. Anyone who calls himself this title, just get rid of him. He's making a fool of his students, he tells a newspaper uh, in Amritsar shortly after. Um, but it kind of falls on deaf ears. And one of the things that we found in the course of reporting is that as a congregational tradition, Sikhi is different than something that's very hierarchical, like the Catholic Church. Um, there's no single place to go to to verify claims. There's no one person who can speak for all six. And so in that kind of organizational structure or lack of organizational structure, claims like this are allowed to circulate. And we also know from further reporting that Yogi Bhajan very much deliberately takes advantage of the fact that six throughout the world are in a very difficult position in the 70s and 80s because of government persecution in India. And he deliberately takes advantage of the fact that even those authorities who know of his worst abuses don't want to call him out for fear of tarnishing the reputation and potentially endangering Sikhs in the diaspora and around the world. Um, there was an amazing slip in 1992, 1993, uh, a Sikh periodical in the US interviews uh, someone at the SGPC about the title. And this person at the SGPC says, the title doesn't, it's not real, it doesn't make sense. He has no business calling himself that. And Yogi Bhajan's own attorney, a man named Ramda Singh Khalsa, he issues a sternly worded letter to this periodical and he says, who are they to say that he can't use the title? And basically says, it's his own title. It's part of his own organization. He can do what he wants with it. And kind of admitting that um, it was nothing more than his own title. Mm. Um, the real undoing of the title uh, happens upon his death. So none of these denunciations um, really stick. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, it doesn't matter because under American law, no one scrutinizes religious claims. You can make up whatever you want. And if it's close enough to being a religion, the law is not going to, to go against it. What does happen is that Yogi Bhajan doesn't um, nominate a successor to the Siri Singh Sab title. And that's the whole essence of a corporation soul. It allows a title holder to manage the assets of a religion. And if there's no person to take the title on, it falls apart. As we said in the piece, a monarchy needs a sovereign. And after Yogi Bhajan dies, there's like a giant battle royal and the empire falls into this huge series of warring factions and contentious lawsuits. And at the end of the day, it's not Sikh authorities and it's not the American law that dismantles the corporation soul and the title. It's Yogi Bhajan's own negligence. And so at the end of all of these court cases, his empire ends up becoming what one person described to us as basically an interlocking series of regular corporations that mm. don't have one person controlling them um, as existed during Yogi Bhajan's lifetime. Amazing. Stacy, go ahead. Well, I just will also note like the interesting remnant of this is that the yoga is still going and kind of strong. Yeah. And um, it's an interesting dissonance how, you know, I don't know, you know, I, Philip and I have a joke. Do people Google? Wait, have you Googled that? <laughs> you know? And so it's this thing where, you know, I, I don't I don't begrudge anybody for doing something that makes them feel better, keeps them sober, what it, you know, keeps them healthy, calm, happy. When I first met Stacy and she was talking to me for her Los Angeles magazine piece, 
um, I had some quote where I said he'll be remembered like the Harvey Weinstein or the Jeffrey Epstein of yoga. Mm -hmm. And I very much believe that, you know, in the face of massive abuse and neglect of children, grooming of young women, sexual assault, sexual abuse, in addition to financial exploitation and fraud and the misrepresentation of a religious tradition like Sikhi for like very kind of vulgar ends, how could that sustain itself? On top of the fact that, you know, it's well documented that he kind of just cobbled the yoga together. It doesn't have the lineage he claims. And I could not imagine it continuing as it had. And I mean, never underestimate the power of self-centered spiritual seekers to ultimately make things about them and not about other people. Mm -hmm. um, it really, even all of that was not enough for so many people to let go of the yoga that they like to do, the good feeling that they got from dressing up and teaching yoga from a platform to other people, um, the identities that they had built within the organization, um, or even something as kind of uh, simple and boring as continuing to hold on to their good memories of the organization and believing that it was somehow ultimately good. It's, I think it's kind of a, a shocking and kind of depressing uh, thing to see that not even that amount of suffering is enough to make many people pause and think twice and reconsider what they built or um, what they contributed to. Mm. Well, I have absolutely loved learning about this. Like I said at the, out at the outset, this is a brand new topic for me. And so this article, how Siri Singh Saab, Yogi Bhajan created an empire is wonderful. I highly encourage folks to check out the piece because there is there are numerous uh, scans and newspaper stories and archival uh, things that you all dug up to include within the piece. And so, you know, Stacy, I'm wondering if you can just tell listeners where they can find you if they want to know more about your work or if there's anything in particular that you would like for folks to check out next. What would you suggest if people want to get in touch or uh, find more of your stuff? Um, well, I'm I'm on Twitter under Stacy Stukin and most of the other social media platforms. And my website is the same, stacystukin.com. And do I sound like Ron Popeil now? Slice it, dice it, stacystukin.com. <laughs> Just cash it. <laughs> Just cash it. <laughs> Well, Stacy, I actually, I literally just followed you on Twitter, like just this very second. Um, <laughs> Philip, where can folks find you if they want to uh, know more, get in touch or follow along with what you do? Um, I have a website, philipdslip.com. And I try to post uh, links and copies of everything I've written on there. And it has a, a contact form. And no, you can email me through my website as well. Excellent. Stacy Stukin. Thank you so much for joining me today. I have loved hearing your examples and your stories of reporting. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Philip D. Slip, thank you for coming back to the show and hanging out again. It's been a delight to have you on again. Always happy to be on. Thanks, Greg. <laughs>